Cool. So, um, was anybody not here this morning? Okay, that's cool. So, yeah, of course you weren't. Um, this morning we just sort of had a brief chat about um, the sort of state of open source forensics and where um, where it's at and um, how how we can we can use sort of open source tools to to potentially combat um, some of the commercial software that's out there in the court setting and a, a, a sort of a, a high level overview of, of the way that forensics um, is uh, and um, for, for those of you that weren't here this morning just a quick recap um, forensics is to do with the presentation of evidence in court in a legal setting um, such that it um, is able to sway an argument one way or another uh, for the poor person standing uh, in front of the judge and the jury. Um, as I said this morning, I'm actually a, a defense expert. I defend people who are thoroughly unpleasant and disgusting and do all sorts of horrible things because under the UK legal system, we are obliged to have a fair and balanced trial. I do not do anything that is not the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But, you know, you are free to judge me how you feel fit. It has to be done. I'd rather somebody competent was doing it than somebody not. I sincerely hope you never ever come across a, a, a security incident. That will never happen. You will all have come across a security incident at some point in, in your careers um, as sysadmins or as, uh, as managers or whatever it is that, that, that it is that you actually do for a day-to-day -day job. And a, a security incident can be anything from somebody sending a, a document out of the organization in a way that they shouldn't, uh, sort of personally identifiable information, credit card numbers being emailed to their home account, or it could be somebody breaking in and defacing your website, or it could be one of your employees conducting massive industrial espionage, or it could be piracy, downloading of indecent images, that kind of thing. These things will happen on your network sooner or later. I'm sorry, it's true. Um, this talk is designed to give you a, a, an overview and an idea about the way that you might want to approach that. Now, I've not made a clear distinction in the rest of the talk between incident response and digital forensics. Um, but essentially, uh, something my, my old RSM used to tell me is that uh, piss poor planning will lead to piss poor performance and therefore whatever it is that you're going to go and, and, and do, please consider this up front. Go, go back to your offices, find out if you have an incident response policy, which you all do. If you have a forensic response policy, which you all mm, probably don't. <coughs> um, and find out what it is and, and get it put in place because when something is actually going wrong and you really, really need to resolve it, that is not the time to hold the interesting and, and detailed debate about whether this is something we're going to deal with today or whether we're just going to not pass it over to the police. That's not the time to hold that conversation. It needs to be calm, measured, in your own time. Ah, see, things go wrong. Okay, and you need to have it clearly stated what it is that you're willing to accept. If somebody's going to deface your website, is it really a big deal? Do you want to involve the police? Probably not, actually, for nine, nine out of ten of us. If you're the CIA, yes, that, that's kind of more important. What are your legal obligations? What sort of data do you have? Um, if you have <coughs> personal identifiable information, credit card numbers, what are your obligations for letting the people know? Um, if you have medical data, what are your obligations? Uh, I did a, a stint of work as a sysadmin, not as a forensic or a security analyst, um, at the Institute of Cancer Research. And um, they carry out animal testing uh, in, in the best possible way to cure disease, not, not anything untoward. Um, and the legal obligations for the mice were considerably higher than the legal obligations for the staff. <laughs> um, we, we sat in, a, in an office with broken air conditioning for three weeks. They had a three-hour SLA. Okay, it's, it's like that. Um, so you need to understand what your obligations are, what your legal obligations are. And your, your plans and procedures, um, they need to contain the information about who do you tell. So what's your escalation policy? Um, 
who do you notify, which management, which, which person do you want to wake up at 3 a.m., is it that important? Um, what will your job be like tomorrow if you do? Who do you call in? Um, if you're there on your own on the weekend shift, do you call network managers? Do you call network specialists? Um, do you have all of the things you need at hand? If you're looking at specialist forensic tools, write blockers and all those kind of things, that's one thing. Maybe spare disks, maybe spare switches. Maybe you want to pull a, 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 con a contaminated computer, contaminated switch, put a clean one in with a known configuration. It'll depend upon your environment, your SLAs, your requirements. Um, but all of that stuff needs to be thought out up front. Otherwise, you're running around like a headless chicken and all sorts of things are still going wrong. And do you have the access you need? Um, quite a lot of you will be root or sudo more appropriately. Um, but would you be sudo on all of the systems in somewhere that you need to be? Who are you going to need to call? And then, when you have all of this, and you've got it all written down, simulate something. Simulate uh, an attack. Test it. Refine it. Practice it. Make sure you know what's going to happen. The, the reason that, that you know all the sportsmen do all of those drills... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> swipe cards. That's a, I, mean, say I, I did a talk a few years back on disaster recovery, and that was the wonderful thing that, that everybody turned up uh, outside the uh, offices uh, at the beginning of the disaster recovery exercise, and it was like, no, the offices have burnt down. Everybody needs to go to the backup site. And everybody went, well, where is it? Nobody had a map. Nobody knew where it was. They knew what it was called, but nobody knew where it was. So, you know, you do need to make sure that you have your, your kit ready. Um, and refine it. If it doesn't work, refine it. Repair it. As I was saying, there's a difference between incident response and digital forensics. Uh, incident response is about getting your systems back up online as quickly as possible, minimizing downtime, maximizing company profits, minimizing impact to users, all of that rubbish. Okay, I'm a forensic analyst. I don't care. If it takes me three weeks to figure out what's happened, that's what I want to do. Okay, now, obviously, there has to be a reasonable compromise somewhere in the middle of that. And this is why your two policies need to be written together, or at least well aligned. Um, and the preservation of evidence should occur before any remediation of the issue happens. Okay, because otherwise you stand a chance of destroying evidence. There are a, a, a number of different sort of things. Um, there's the Association of Chief Police Officers Guidelines, the ACPO Guidelines. This is much the same sort of thing, but drawn from the EEC guidance. There are five principles for first response. Data integrity, audit trail, you can all read, specialist support, appropriate training and legality. These map very closely to the ACPO Guidelines. The ACPO Guidelines being data integrity, don't change anything. Uh, audit trail, if you do change anything, make sure you know what it is. Specialist support, only, only trained people should be doing things that change things. Uh, appropriate training, which is the same thing. And legality, um, which is only do things which you're legally allowed to do. We're not going to pay much attention to principles four and five. Obviously, you've written your plans, you've written your policies, you've written your procedures. Make sure you know what you're doing. Okay. Um, if you do not know how to use a write blocker, go on the course. Learn which end plugs into what. Uh, if you do not understand your, your switches particularly well, either go and learn about it or make sure you call the person who does. And legality. Have a chat with your legal department if you have one. Uh, most people do nowadays, somewhere or at least on call, um, and, and find out what your obligations are if you have any. So those are the two fundamental principles, and those are the, um, the outlines from the data, uh, from the ACPO guidelines. So given that, <coughs> your first thing is do no harm. Do not change the evidence. Do not make it go away. Do not delete it. Do not reformat a machine uh, in order to reinstall the operating system until you are happy that you have a working image to work from. Okay. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, I will come to it a bit later on, but I believe that every security incident has a root cause analysis. 
that you can you can deal with and you can improve. Um, if it's somebody downloading illicit images, well, your internet browsing policy is wrong for a start. Um, your monitoring is wrong. They shouldn't be. They should have perhaps been vetted better. Who knows? But there's a selection of things that you could be looking at to improve your stance, to improve your security stance. Um, so you really want to be taking the opportunity to look at any incident. Now, whether this goes to the police or not is irrelevant. You know, quite often a security incident won't. I mean, we lose data left, right and centre in various places I've worked. Um, but the bottom line is, is that it's not police worthy. The most important thing in your, no in your forensic kit or your, your incident response kit should be a pen and paper. Now, I, as the amount of people that are sitting and typing on laptops, a pen and paper is really, really good because you can't change it, it can't be edited, it can be countersigned, you can present it as evidence easily in court, you stand there and you go, hi, this is my book. Okay, and this is what is there. So date it, <coughs> write on it, don't leave large gaps, draw diagrams, smiley faces, those sort of things. Make sure that you make loads of copious notes. They're called contemporaneous notes, so stuff that you make up as you go, not make up, write down as you go along. <laughs> if you are in any doubt, call for help, okay? And help doesn't have to be a forensic professional, it doesn't have to necessarily be the police. It could be somebody of your colleagues who perhaps is a little more experienced than you. Better to phone somebody up, say, excuse me, I'm not really sure about this, can you give us a hand? And learn something new and get it right than screw up and destroy evidence. Any, any indecent images, phone the police immediately. If you are found to have covered up or handled or done anything with an indecent image that you have not notified the police of, you stand a chance of being done for creating, if you make a copy, distribution, if you send it to somebody, possession, if you have it in your, in your computer or on a computer that you own. And those charges will be leveled against you if you are not careful. Okay? Do not mess about. Okay? As in an example given earlier by our friend over there, um, management had discussed covering up indecent images and it would not go well and none of them have their jobs anymore. Yep. So, uh, remarkably well, um, <laughs> indecent images are, well, there are various classes of indecent image. Basically anything that involves child pornography is, is absolutely indecent. They're categorized on a scale of A through C, A through D. Um, depending upon their severity and, and content. Um, there are also various ones to do with things like bestiality and other unpleasant subjects. Um, the, I won't go any further, but the definitions are available online quite easily. Um, just look up indecent images in a safe <laughs> Google search. <laughs> So, <coughs> you, you get the call, 3 a.m. in the morning, like usual. Never happens at a nice sort of, you know, 10.30, that'd be good, wouldn't it? It's 5 o'clock on a Friday, 3 a.m. on a Saturday morning. So you arrive at the scene. Now, the scene is a, a, a pretty loose term, okay? Um, from my perspective, I tend not to arrive at scenes. People send me things after, after, the, after the imaging has been done. But in the past, you, you arrive at an office, and there may be a machine on a desk or a laptop on a desk. Um, you may, depending upon the circumstances, you may be breaking into somebody's office while they're in a meeting um, in order to image theirs to prove that they're doing something they shouldn't be. Um, I had the pleasure of flying via South Africa to Harare in Zimbabwe to uh, take some laptops for maintenance um, overnight. Who believes this rubbish? Um, take some laptops for maintenance overnight, image them, and then fly back to the UK the next day with the images to check for wrongdoing. 
Um, so that was kind of fun. Um, but you, you turn up and you will go into an office, you'll go into a scenario, and you've got to be aware of your surroundings. Now, this isn't just a health and safety thing. In, um, many of you will be working in server rooms, will be working in environments where health and safety is an issue. Um, in that particular Zimbabwe case, um, <laughs> we'd ship the servers with UK plugs. Um, and Zimbabwe doesn't use UK plugs, they use something different. So they jammed them in. Um, and uh, uh, shocking is all I can say. Um, so, so, you know, health and safety can be an issue. Um, but, but look around. So, so take, take care of yourself. You are more important than any computer system, so make sure that that's fine. Um, if, you, if there is a chance of somebody returning and they may not be nice, um, talk with security first. The, this can happen. Not in my experience, but it can. And then look around. People have computers. Then they have disks. They have USB disks. And they have, um, you know, external hard drives. They have post-it notes stuck to their monitors with their passwords on or under their keyboards or in their top drawers <laughs> or are stuck underneath the table um, or in their notepads on the first page. So have a look around the scene, see what there is, see what's available to you. If you have a digital camera, take photos. Most of us have a phone now, take photos. Um, it's fine to use a phone cam uh, photo as evidence, that's not a problem, because you're taking a, a scene. It's not, not, not particularly thing. If it's, even if it's your own office, um, and it's somewhere you're used to being, you know, it's the open plan bit where you're normally based, still take a look around because you might notice something. And it's good to take a deep breath before you start doing any, you know, mental work anyway. Just give yourself a, a second to think. And then start to think about identifying the individuals who are involved, the systems that are involved, okay? So this person has this machine on their desktop, but they also have access to this server or these servers. Um, <coughs> they also have an email account, which is hosted over here. Um, so, so consider that, and, and they also work as part of this group. So what else in this group access might they have? So there's, there's quite a lot that you can, you can start to build as a picture of, um, of what's going on. All this time you're taking notes, writing stuff down. You should include times and dates, clearly. Um, especially when you start to do something. At 10.53, I typed in ls at the prompt. Okay, it gets really tedious. It does, I'm sorry, but it's really good to do. Okay? When you are a little more familiar with doing it, you start to do things like, at 10.53, I image the entire disk, and you don't put the commands down. But it helps if you have a process. At 10.53, I started process X. And then you've got the process, and you can say, I did all of the steps in that. Makes it a bit easier. Your location, where you are, may be self-evident, but when you're presenting this in court, they go, are you sure you were at his desk? Yes, I'm sure I was at his desk. It's going to be in the book. All of the people that are present, OK? Um, the reason being that you may wish to call them in evidence to support you at a later date. Um, but it's also good to know that so-and-so uh, was here. I, you can ask him. These are the other people that helped me. I asked him this. <coughs> Quick sketch of the location or photo of the location. Always good. Um, you can take video. Uh, I had a lovely police case where they videoed the whole thing. They kicked the door in, ran upstairs. There was this guy's server farm. He had, you know, half a dozen routers and uh, three or four machines. And they, they, they filmed the entire thing. And it took me about four days to cut and paste images from the entire thing to make a screen, to make a single photo that I could present to a court to say, this is a router, this is a router, this is a router. They seized these three, they didn't seize this one. Why the hell didn't they seize this one? Okay, so just think about how it's gonna play out in court, but think ahead. If you happen to be operating in a third party capacity, you are a service provider and you're going in. Take a member of staff of the organization with you, okay? Apart from anything else, they have inside knowledge you don't. Oh, this is Bob. He spends a lot of time doing whatever. Um, we've always thought he was a bit shifty. It's amazing how often they say that. 
If you thought it was a bit shifty, why didn't you tell somebody? Um, anyway, take them with you. Um, they will be able to give you additional information. You're documenting all of this. Um, when you're done, get them to countersign. You don't want to go into a scenario where the company is coming back to you going, oh, but you deleted all our data. Well, no, I didn't delete your data. I didn't. You can see my notes. It's been countersigned. You can see what I've done. OK. At this point, you're starting to get to the hands-on phase. Okay. Now, you've got to balance your uh, incident response and digital forensics. Now, depending upon what your scenario is, sorry, I'll move it. There you go. <laughs> um, depending upon what your scenario is, depending upon what it is, you can, you can start this process. Now, I won't give you particular examples other than the one there. It will depend upon your own organization as to what you do in what circumstances, okay? If your raison d'etre as a company is to be up 100% of the time, the most important thing for you is incident response, with the exception of indecent images, okay? So, forensics, your forensic investigation will be slightly more limited. You will take what you can as quickly as possible and move on to resolving the issue. If your reason as a company is to protect your customers' data, I can't think of a single company that does that, but that's, you know, <laughs> that, 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 let's say that that exists, um, then forensics would take priority and incident response would be a back burner thing. Okay? But this is why you have your policies and procedures and plans all sorted out up front. So you can have this discussion. You can get the risk appetite from your management. You can get the direction. If your system is of forensic interest, but potentially a risk, so a malware outbreak, isolate. Hacking, isolate. <coughs> Disconnect the network. It may be that you wish to do some sort of analysis about the volatility and pull memory, pull IP tables, pull connections. But if, I, if incident response is your priority, pull the plug. On the network, not on the machine, on the network. OK, so we've done our triage. We've decided that System X, let's say this laptop, for the sake of argument, this laptop is the only machine we're interested in. We're going to seize it. We're going to take a copy of the hard disk. What do we know about it? Is it running? Is it on? Yes, no, simple answer. Is it networked? Well, we just pulled the plug because we think it's being used for something nefarious. Do we care about the volatile data on it? Is the data that's being held in memory going to be important to us? May it contain passwords that are useful? May it contain copies of uh, RAM-based malware or I don't know, connection tables or whatever it is that, that your triage has shown it possible to contain? Or is there file or disk encryption that is an issue? Okay. If the answer to both of those things is, is no, um, you don't want to preserve the volatile data and disk encryption is not an issue, it's easy. I mean, it's really easy. You turn it off, you image the disk, you just carry on and then wipe it and start again. <coughs> if there's volatile data you need, you need to get into it to get the memory out. And if there's file or disk encryption, you need to get into it to get the image out. Unless you, as an organization, and it's an organizational laptop, have decryption keys. Okay? Is it currently unlocked? That makes it really easy. It's not very often, but it makes it really easy. If in your forensic kit, I would thoroughly recommend that you get ah, my microphone. Do that myself with a laser. Uh, right, one of those, which is tiny and pathetic. That's also one of those that has died a much harder life. Um, there's a mouse jiggler. If you put that into a machine, just into a USB port, it pretends to be a mouse, moves it every couple of seconds, just a fraction of a thing. It will keep your screen alive forever. 
This is also really, really good, okay? If you're working from home, plug it in, okay? Your IM never goes dead. You just put it on busy, never shuts down, never says away. Brilliant. <laughs> They're only a couple of quid, you can get them on Amazon. Fabulous. Okay, um, keep it unlocked, okay? Because if it's unlocked, you can get into it, you can do everything you want. If you have administrative access, things are pretty easy anyway. Okay. You need to consider, I mean, that's, that's a single machine. That's easy, you, know, you image it. Uh, I won't go into imaging tools, but DD is great uh, if you're doing a Linux laptop. DD is great if you're doing a Windows laptop. Um, FTK Imager is a free download. It's not open source, but it is free. Very, very good. Memory, you'll need to go and look up volatility, um, the site. Loads of information about getting memory capture and analyzing it as well, brilliant site. You need to consider the scope of your incident, okay? So, um, if it's a small incident, I mean, security incidents, like I said, they range. If somebody's just emailed out some odd data, you're probably not looking at very much. You're looking at their disk, maybe a copy of their PST file. You're not going to image the whole email server. It's pointless. <coughs> if they've used some... Um, shared space on the server to store something. Are you going to image the whole server? Could be huge. Terabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes. Some people in here, possibly. I had a petabyte data store once upon a time. Um, yeah, so you're not going to image the whole thing. You're just going to take a logical copy of the, of the section. The thing is, is that Depending upon the level of analysis you're doing, if you're doing it on, a, on an individual laptop, you're going to pick up a, a deleted file. That's fine. If you're doing it on a massive RAID array, you're not going to get individual deleted files because those things are actually really, you know, using their space to the best of their possible ability. They're going to mark it. They're going to delete it. They're going to wipe it. And recovering it is going to be a nightmare. If it's not direct attached storage, don't bother. Take a logical image. Database only, possibly. You might want to get a DBA in, take a couple of tables, full disk image. Nah. I mean, you can do a full disk image of a database server, but why would you want to? Again, it's more effort than it's worth. You're going to have to look through it at the end of the day. You don't want to make your life more difficult. If you are fortunate enough to have a working logging and monitoring system, you may have more information in there than you have on the disk anyway. Okay? Um, and I stick by if you're fortunate enough to in 20 years of doing IT, I think one I've come across that was efficient. And the reason was because it used to belong to GCHQ. So they should get it right. But did you say one that was efficient? Efficient and worked and right. logged everything it should. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah just the one. Um, if it's a virtual machine, again, really easy. Just image the machine, take a copy. When we talked about doing backups of the um, machine earlier today, just image a whole machine, that's fine. That's really easy. Um, it may be possible just to pull backups. If you have backed up a machine overnight and you happen to know that whatever happened happened a couple of days ago, go back to a backup a couple of days ago, use that. Why, you know, you don't have to shut the thing down necessarily. If you're not sure, go over. Over collect. Disk is relatively cheap. It's time, but it's relatively cheap. Finding data that you should have got the first time around when you go back to look for it again is hard. Okay, over collect. Um, principle three in the list. If you don't know, if you are unsure, not necessarily you don't know what you're doing. It's not fair. We all know huge amounts about what we do. And we all have a pretty good idea about quite a lot of the things we don't do on a daily basis. But at the end of the day, if you want to take it to court, you need to prove that what you have done is reasonable. Okay? Or you have to at least prove that what you have done hasn't altered evidence in a way that would compromise the, the data. Okay? So if you're not sure, ask someone. Okay? Does RM minus RF really work? It's, not, it's no harm. Make a phone call. Get it sorted out. It doesn't necessarily have to be a call to a specialist forensic person. Your DBA, your network admin, all good. So you've identified your, 
your scope of interest. And we were talking a little earlier today about Facebook profiles, for example. Um, Facebook gives you the opportunity to you log in with a username and password, um, which has been <laughs> kindly given to you by the criminal. And then you go down, um, and there's a button on there in the, in the settings that says, download my entire profile. Fantastic, you do that. So you take screenshots during the process of doing it, you download it, you hash it, you bundle it all together, you send it. It's done. You have a full forensic copy. Okay, so long as you can document and you document it, and write down what the hash result is. Okay, make sure you write it down right. If you're dyslexic, get somebody to check it. Okay. Um, and then store, store this information securely. So I'm, I'm sure most of you have access to a safe somewhere in the organization, usually for backups. Um, if there are a limited number of key holders, then you can put your forensic work in there. Like I said, I'm a huge believer that there is no such thing as a lesson that can't be learned from something that goes wrong. Anything that can go wrong, um, whether it's technical, we should have had more redundancy, whether it's procedural, um, we should have vetted them better, and they've run off with the cash box, or whether it's um, you know, technical in, in the sense of we didn't configure Apache right, they've come in through the web server. Under all of the circumstances, there is something that you can do, something that you can improve to prevent the same thing from happening again. Right. I lecture at the Montfort University. I lecture a postgraduate course, I have several postgraduate courses um, on network forensics, uh, Linux forensics, and that kind of thing. And we get a lot of police officers on. And one of the questions they always ask is, how do I work with a sysadmin? I say, buy them beer. Um, I tell them to talk to you. I tell them to buy you beer as well, and they get a laugh as well. But I tell them to talk to you because you know your network better than they do. Their knee-jerk reaction, if they hear that there's something that they need to investigate, will be come in and seize everything. Because it's easier for them to take it back, put it in a plastic bag, take it back to the, to, to the station, and image it at a later date. Okay, that's your business gone for the foreseeable future. If your case hang, if, if, if the case strings out, and they can string out for years, you will not get your kit back for years. Okay? So work with them. They want to work with you because they're as petri in my experience, they're petrified as soon as they see a network. Knocking on, a, on an individual's house door and pulling his laptop is one thing. Walking in and, and finding a network, not so much. They're not that good at it. So talk to them. Help them to find out what it is that they want to know. They're looking at an individual. You talk them through what access they had. Demonstrate to them what access they had. Show them your uh, Active Directory or your Identity and Access Management solution that shows that they are in these groups. These groups have access to these machines. Um, I'm not suggesting that any of you would go rogue um, in any way. Um, but there was a very interesting case um, a friend of mine did at a school um, where a sysadmin had, uh, he'd been running a distribution server and had checked up on his server. But he'd gone around at uh, various times during the school day when people were in different classrooms. He'd gone around each machine in the network, logged on, his profile had downloaded, collected, and, um, and there was evidence on pretty much every machine in the network because you know, he had been everywhere. If you can demonstrate to someone that this person has only ever used that machine, they're only going to be interested in that machine. If you can't, they might be interested in more than that. Um, keep copies of everything that you do. Okay? If you're working with the police, you may be asked to come and present evidence on their behalf for them, for the prosecution. You may be asked to come and present evidence on the behalf of the defense. Uh, called as a hostile witness, maybe. If I find that you've done something wrong, I will tell the solicitor that he should be cross-examining you. Okay? I won't do it maliciously. I'll just be saying that, look, it's like that, and he will pull you up in court. He will not be nice about it. If I can find a way to cover up your mistake if the person is guilty, not cover up, but to, to work around it and say you have done this, 
and it has affected that, but this evidence has not been touched, I will do that. Okay? This file is still here. It couldn't have been altered by your actions. I will do that for you. But if you do something that does alter evidence, changes the file times, changes the stamps, I will pull you up on it, because I have to. Okay? And the solicitor will, the barrister will in court, and he won't be nice about it. It's not fun. Okay? Cool. Any questions? Tell me the questions. Um, preservation. I think I missed the slide as well. But anyway, carry on. Evidence. If you go around and start taking photographs of, let us say, your mobile phone, or you copy stuff onto um, some removable media. Yep. Will the police want to say, "Oh, let's um, grab that mobile phone, and let's <laughs> keep it as evidence"? Or will they say, okay, yes, you can copy that off onto wherever and you can have your phone back? You, you, you get my drift. <laughs> I do get your drift, and I have seen both happen. I have seen both happen. Um, and, how can, and, and how can you get your phone back? What do you say to them if you just want it back and they can kick the... My experience generally is, is if you are assisting the police, they will do everything they can to make your life as easy as possible because you have committed no crime. If they suspect you in any way, then forget it, you won't get your phone back ever. Um, <clears throat> what can you do? Cooperate. More than anything, cooperate. Let them take your phone, let them image it. And this is a good reason why you shouldn't do anything dodgy with your phones, by the way. Um, it, let them take it, let them image it. That, that will be fine. They will then be satisfied that they have the copy of that and they should return your phone to you because you are not under any suspicion. Um, if you have a separate digital camera, do that. They won't seize the camera, they'll just take the SD card. Um, so, you know, it, it depends what you have available. Um, in, in terms of presenting, I, I'm going to say, like I said, I have seen one case where they seized the phone. Um, but it was slightly different because the phone was taking images of Snapchat, which was evidence in itself, because the Snapchat had gone. And the phone was the primary source of evidence. It just then became the primary source of evidence because it was the photo of the photo, if you see what I mean. And it was the only source of it, at which point that was seized, um, even though the person hadn't committed the crime. Uh, I suppose technically they were duplicating an image, but um, you know th th that was. Sorry. Screenshot of something that shouldn't have been sent. Yeah, yeah, but uh, under the circumstances, it was it was passed over, but it was. Um, so but that just, phone was seized. So if you're just using your laptop as a temporary store to copy something from A to B and then write it to a CD to give to them that, they're not bothered about that? Uh, I'm going to say, the only exception will be is if it's illicit images, it, it, which is why you call them up front. You don't want to deal with it. Um, help them deal with it, but don't, don't get involved otherwise. Um, but yeah, otherwise, no, you'll, you'll, you'll just help them out. Uh, you know, if, it, if it's coming to that, you'll be fine. It won't be an issue. Go. In the scenario where the police come to ask for your assistance, but they don't come with any paperwork, so for example, you get a community protection officer come round and they let you know that somebody that <coughs> comes to your workplace or use whatever uh, has been arrested, and they're saying, well, um, uh, they're using any of the computers. Do you have? Do you have any? Do you have any files you could send us? You know, they're kind of being a bit vague because they don't really know anything about computers. What do you do? Cooperate reasonably. Vague, you, you can't respond to a vague, vague request. Uh, if that's the, the trick, the trick is to find a senior officer, okay? Because they are actually the one who is legally obli ob obligated, obliged. Anyway, th that has the legal responsibility under the ACPO guidelines is the senior investigating officer. So if you are unsure of what they are after, find out who he is and ask him or her. Sorry, don't mean to be sexist. Find out who they are and ask them, okay? Um, I would start the second you know. If you if you think if you think they have reasonable cause, then start. If they're on a fishing expedition, it's open to debate. But the thing is, is that you can throw it away. What what does it matter? You've you've started taking the evidence. They don't come and ask for it. You get rid of it. Just just you know delete it. Sorry. Balance between privacy and collecting evidence. 
and should and should you only do, do it and hand it over if you've got a court order or something? <coughs> <laughs> Good question. Um, I would suggest, well, there is no privacy because you are using a, a, net, a machine which belongs to the organisation that you are working for. I tend to contract and do freelance stuff. You are an interesting exception to this rule then. Um, Generally speaking, an organisation will provide the machinery that's used and therefore the law is on the side of the organisation to provide the information and there is no expectation of privacy. <coughs> that should be covered by the contracts of employment and that should also be con covered by your contracts of employment with whoever it is that you are working with. So for the duration of your work with us, all of the information that you create belongs to us and therefore we have the right to call on it. The question about whether it's whether the rest of the laptop is yours or theirs is iffy, but, but yeah. Um. Sorry. Yeah. Somewhere along the line of that, make sure that you have a contract that specifically states where intellectual property is and confidentiality. Yeah. Because if you do not have that, you cannot claim that you're an individual, that you're an outside contractor, because you're not covering yourself. So the system will protect the people who've got the correct contract Yeah. I'll put that in context that I wrote a contract for freelancers who were coming <coughs> to work for Experian, and I made damn sure that we could do whatever the hell we wanted with their laptops. Um, uh, they didn't like it very much, but they either wanted to work or they didn't. So that, that was, you know, so, so your contract is, is the, the arbiter of this. Yeah. What do you do in a situation where you are a contractor and you uh, offer these terms? Well, as in if somebody sent these, these terms to me? So if somebody sent your own terms to you and said, your laptop belongs to us while you're working for us? Um, I, I, I have worked with those terms before, and what I do is I spin up a separate machine. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I literally, I mean, I have, I have four machines under my desk anyway. One of them just becomes belonging to somebody else for, for well, belonging to, for, for the duration. Yeah, and then D band comes into play at the end of it. So, so. Yeah. At which point, at the end of the contract, you delete the virtual machine and give the Yeah. And you're completely covered. Just make sure it's clearly written. That's that's your. Yeah. I found it's the best way. Yeah. With regard to student data, I think you'll find that the university owns all rights to the machines. It's the same principle, just in a in a slightly different context. Yeah. You mentioned that the lawyers could be quite nasty to you in, in, yeah. uh, when you're standing up in court. Uh, are the, the lawyers who do this stuff, are they computer experts themselves, or is, <laughs> it, is it possible for them no. to bring in experts? <laughs> yes. So, no, they're not experts. A lawyer can't tell the one end of a computer from another. In all seriousness, they are useless. I mean, to be fair, I mean, they've spent the last five years at university studying law. I mean, they can type just about if you're lucky. Um, and their mind is full of cases and stuff. So they, they're not computer experts. Um, I have had some stunning case conferences where the, um, the explanations have gotten dumber and dumber and dumber to the point of some analogies that were just so vague and wishy-washy to just try and get it into this, these, these people's heads. Um, one minute. Um, the trouble is, is that they will instruct, I mean, in, in, in my case, I would instruct them as to the line of questioning to follow. And the way they're nasty is that they don't give you a chance to speak. So they'll go, is it true that you, uh, you didn't uh, get a degree? And you'll go, well, I, 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 uh, but I have years of experience. They'll say, but you didn't get a degree, did you? Like, well, no. Well, therefore, you're not qualified. To do it. It, they just don't give you the, the leg to stand on, even though you're right. And the only, as an expert, you can appeal to the judge if you're lucky say, Your Honour, I wish to make a comment, but otherwise, you know, you can, you can be made to look a real fool, even though you're, you've done nothing wrong. Um, they, they can be quite harsh. But it's their job, you know. Um, if your, your side's solicitor is any good, he should be jumping up and going objection every two seconds um, to, to keep them under control. So.
Right. Thanks, Simon. You're welcome.